Hello, I am Eric Devante with Rich Girl Network TV, and today we are in Beverly Hills on North Robertson Boulevard in the Mark Zanino studio, talking to the creator himself about his designs, his early beginnings, and his inspirations. Make sure you stay tuned to richgirlnetwork.tv. This collection was pretty much about the fabrication. So we um, are able to always get the um, luxury textiles out of Europe. They usually come here, show us their collection, and then we have exclusivity on them here in the United States. So this, this collection was driven by what I saw because the collections were amazing. Yeah, we um, uh, we have a so we have an atelier bridal collection, which is our our top tier, and then we have couture, which is mid tier, and then we have a diffusion collections, which is a little more affordably priced, but um, it's um, still a very progressive modern approach. It's not your typical bride. My original um, background's in architecture, so that's how I started, and then I started working for a Hollywood designer back in the day and then partnered and took over the company. So the sort of the secrets of Hollywood have always been my inspiration. It's um, we start from the inside out. We slim curve, reshape a woman's body from the inside of the garment, even if it's a jacket or, you know, a pair of pants, it's the way it seemed that makes the difference um, all the way through our evening wear that is um, constructed in a way that we can usually take two to three inches off of anybody's waist. It's very similar, and I believe for anyone, design is design is design. So whether you want to design buildings, furniture, clothing, it's pretty much all the same. And so once I got into it, um, while well, also meeting major celebrities at the beginning, I was starstruck. I just thought it was unbelievable. Meeting and becoming friends with Joan Collins was huge. And to this day, like I just had dinner with her, she, she's a huge force in my life. She, when she came onto the show, pulled a European aesthetic into, you know, the, the Dynasty show, but into America, America tele, American television. And, and so it was something that, I mean, in a weird way, then the internet was in its infancy. So television was sort of, sort of like the internet globally we'd air a dynasty episode and globally everybody would see it and then you know exploiting american wealth we would get calls from everyone saudi royalty we everybody wanted that look of whatever alexis and everybody wore yeah. the previous week that's what they wanted us to make for them so they were flying us around the world as we would make private wardrobes we were also doing the show as well i was in school and they worked around my schedule which is amazing and then as i really got sucked into the you know, the, the, this company, the production of clothing, um, I was able to graduate and then just hit the ground running. So it was pretty amazing. Yeah. It's still to this day. I mean, even, even all the interns here when they're like, what? And we start showing them YouTube or Hulu excerpts from it and they're just blown away. So it's been a lot of fun. Also, it was, I now realize the catalyst to everything I do as far as my celebrity affiliation, it opened the door in a way that I never could have done on my own. Well, what happened is we started, I just was designing for Nolan Miller. So we started Nolan Miller. And then um, as I kept progressing, it was Nolan Miller by Mark Zanino. And then one collection got too progressive for Nolan. He didn't like it. He hated it. <laughs> and um, so I had the collection on a rack and then I we did, had another collection that was what Nolan wanted. And Sophia Loren flew into town for, um, she was um, presenting an award on, at the Academy Awards. So we just said, everyone stay quiet. Let her see which rack she goes to and what she picks. So she went in, went to the new rack, picked it, and Nolan threw his hands up. He said, I don't understand this anymore. <laughs> so he said, but he hated the collection. So he said, if you feel so strongly about this, put your name on it. I don't want my name on it. And I did, and that's how the label started. So that started as Mark Zanino for Nolan Miller. And then finally Nolan said, just take my name off. He, <laughs> it was all too much for him. Well, the crazy thing was, it was the very beginning of everything being so sheer. So Sophia picked a dress that had a, a lace over nude, you know, bustier and mini skirt. And then it had just one sheer chiffon overlay. So you could see right through and see the silhouette of her legs and everything. And Nolan thought it was ridiculous. And Sophia put it on. And when she said, this is what I'm going to wear, he said, but you can see 
right through your dress. You can see your legs. You can see everything. Right. And she looked at him and said, and what's wrong with my legs? And that's when he said, forget it. <laughs> Sophia um, loved to push an envelope. She had that European sense of fashion. Um, she was used to being, I mean, she's a, even at this point in her life, she's a very sexy woman. And so she had no problem with it. <laughs> I'd gotten into the music industry doing, you know, working with musicians. Um, and I pulled away from it because I learned from Nolan, once you get labeled a costumer designer, a costume designer customer, it's hard to wash that off. So I didn't do it. And Sophia Vergara, I had, um, she had called my dresser all the time and she said, um, they just told me I'm gonna make a guest appearance at the Grammys. I'm gonna pop up out of the stage with Pitbull, but I'm supposed to wear a bustier and I don't have one. And she's like, it's gotta be amazing. So I did in three days, um, it, it was about 200 hours worth of work, but we had you know all the group, whole group entourage working on it. And we did this fringe gold beaded um, bustier. And what I didn't realize when she came out of the stage, it was like a huge sensation, but Brittany and Mariah and Jennifer Lopez, like everybody saw it. So that next week I got calls from everybody. Wow. Like, can you do me close? So I told everybody I would do one tour. I would do one show, one tour, and then I was going to stop. So pretty much that's what I've done. Um, and so within each person, I've um, done things that I've really loved. Um, but I think... I think Mariah is the one that kind of shocked me the most and got me to pump the brakes on it. I did a dress for her and it was low front, low back, super short in front, big train in the back. And when I, and it was, she was wearing it on a television show. When I saw her, it looked really weird because there were like, breasts on her back <laughs> and I thought well, what the hell and she wore the dress backwards oh. she said I, I just thought it looked better this way so she pulled up the train and gathered it up the sides and had the dress on backwards and it looked okay the way that the, the camera shot her but I'm like I'm done <laughs> but this this is not good and so yeah and it's great because I'm all I'm all for everybody you know putting their personality into it but that I was just like, people are going to, you know, look at that and know it's mine and be what the hell is he right. doing? So my mom was very into fashion. I grew up in San Francisco and everybody dressed and it was a conservative dressing. And, um, so now looking back, I realize how aware I was of fashion because of her. But when I started with Nolan, um, I was working with, well, I, we, I was working with women and they were getting, they were older, getting lifetime achievement awards, but we, I was working with Lana Turner, Betty Davis, you know, all those women um, who scared the hell out of me. And they just told me what they were going to wear and why they're like, sketch this. And so that was a huge education. And then sketching for like Elizabeth Taylor, Sophia Loren um, was a huge experience and education as well. But what I realized is that's what, you know, I had already, broke through that glass ceiling by working with Nolan. So that's when over years, that's when then, you know, Jennifer Lopez, you know, Beyonce, uh, you know, Angelina Jolie, like everybody came because I was already there. And I realized had I set out to do that, it never would have happened. But what they were coming to me for is still the Hollywood secrets, the Hollywood stuff that we do internally in a garment, or even we do a ton of independent shapewear. Um, and, and that's why they come. So we can reshape any woman's body one way or another internally from the understructure. And that's, I mean, as soon as you do that to a woman and she knows she feels sexy and looks sexy and looks better than she did when she walked in, you know, she's good. You create this whole new alter ego. Well, the funny thing was I grew up, I was born in San Francisco and then my parents, when I was like two or three, maybe four moved out of the city and moved, um, north towards uh, a little town called Vacaville towards Sacramento. And so my father was um, worked at the school district. He was an athletic director, football coach, he was Mr. Sports. And, and that's what I did. My dad was just like, because I, I was actually two months premature. So I was born extremely tiny. I was two pounds, fit in a shoe box. And um, so my dad's whole goal was to, you know, beef me up and make me stronger. He's like, you're, you know, people in life are going to kick your butt. And so I played, you know, I played baseball, football, uh, ran track. I wrestled, was a huge wrestler. And um, so he taught me competition. And he also taught me, for him, winning was everything. So it was, you know, 
you lost because you want to lose. Are you going to go through life being a loser? Or are you going to choose to win? And it's a choice. And so that gave me, it, you know, it even though at the time I like really resented him for it and we really had animosity between us, but it, it taught me to fight. It taught me to, you know, not let my butt get kicked and to know that if I put my mind to anything, I can do it. And so, especially wrestling, because it's one-on-one. -on -one. And that's where, like, initially I hated it. But once I was good at it, and you realize I won. I won by myself, on my own. And that's something that um, I think was powerful for me going forward. And then also just kids. You know, you when I wanted to do this, my get into fashion, my dad said, no, I'm not going to throw away the education that we just gave you. And... Um, so I said, well, I really like to try this for a year. So my dad flew down, met Nolan, and the day we were fitting, um, that he came to visit, we were fitting um, Sophia Loren and Anne Margaret. And my dad was like, you can stay here as long as you want. And my dad said, you know, I can't help you. I don't know anything about this industry, but, you know, you are on your own. But that's how I always felt. I was on my own. And I just knew don't let it kick my butt, you know? So when I first started with Nolan, you know, Nolan said, you do know fabrics, you know, all about taffeta satin, whatever it is, you know, everything. And I said, yes, I do. And I knew nothing. So I said yes to the job. And then at night I would pay someone at the fabric stores to work after hours and teach me. And so I did a crash course in learning about everything I needed to know. And, and so, and the other thing was to like, once, you know, especially then when I said, you know, I am this guy that wants to go into fashion, everyone kind of gives you side eye. And, uh, and so I had to learn with that, you know, just being okay with that to, to, to fight through it. And, um, to this day, we have a huge internship program and my youngest intern is eight years old. He, somebody that was the grandchild of one of my clients and, uh, and the, the grandmother and the, his mother would come in and ordering clothes. And one day they were crying. I came in and they said, you know, can we have a minute? And they were crying, crying, crying. And I came in and she said, I'm so sorry, but she said, we have a, I have a grandson, her son. And he, for two years, all we hear is he wants to kill himself. And it was blowing my mind because at that age, who says that? At any age, who says it? But at that age. So I met him and, um, you know, realize he most likely is gay, doesn't even know it, but, you know, just knows he's awkward. Flaming red hair, looks like little orphan Annie. And um, he came in and, and and I said, you know, told the mother, you know, he can, he can you know, hang out here. And, and she said he loves fashion. So anyway, we, he would talk, walk around talking to us, you know, and then pretty soon it's like, have you ever been beat up? You know, did kids tease you? And I said all the time, we'd all say, this is how it works. But like the, the kids that are different, are the ones that stand out. Standing out is a good thing. Like it's not right now, but it right. will be wonderful. Right. And um, so he worked with us after about three days. Um, his parents called me crying one night and said, this is the first time in two years that we've heard our son excited. And he said, they like me, they like me for me and I'm going to be okay. And um, he was on a wait list to get to get out of the school district he was in and to get in more of a, uh, you know, art performing school. And, um, but it, but it turned his life around and it's simple things, just listening, you know, caring, you know, every adults telling their story to these little kids that are terrified. And so, um, you know, fashion can fix anything. <laughs> Nolan, Nolan had a massive impact on my life because, Nolan um, was kind of the king of glamour and, you know, all these titles that he was given. And Nolan grew up in a small town in Burke Burnett, Texas. Nolan, um, not a lot of people realize this, but Nolan um, was a half breed. He was, his father was Cherokee Indian. His mother was English. Um, when they got married, they were actually living on a, on a Indian reserve and weren't allowed in town because he was a half breed. So they would like have to walk to, to the edge of town, give their shopping list. Somebody would come and get it, go in, shop, bring the groceries to them at the edge of town, and then they would go back. And so Nolan, you know, and his, and his father, you know, suffered from alcoholism and things. So Nolan had a really rough life and chose Hollywood as an escape and, so Nolan, you know, always said, he said, I'd go sit in the movies and watch movie after movie after movie and think that's where I'm going. I'm going to that place they make these movies. And he ended up doing it and um, created a fantasy. He created 
sort of a, a, a fantasy life for himself. And the thing that I learned that why he had the clients he had, Nolan, Nolan could, would, you know, create an image and a fantasy in through fashion for these people that maybe didn't feel attractive, even though they, you know, they may be someone that you think is beautiful. Um, but most people have insecurities. They have, you know, fears. And, um, if you can help them change that, but it, but it seemed like a facade is what we were creating, but it actually was affecting them internally too. And, and especially with all the, um, you know, our iconic celebrities. I met Barbara Stanwyck, who um, grew up in orphanages. She said, to, you know, to this day, the happiest moment in my life was when I got an actual pair of socks that I could wear in with my shoes because my shoes hurt so much. But she said, until I was about 12, I never had a pair of socks. And she would just bounce around from home to home or orphanage to orphanage. And it was, you know, eye-opening because like with her, she amounted to, you know, top of success in, in as far as acting, but still hung on to all the fears of how she grew up. And so I think if you can give anyone confidence, no matter, you know, what they do in life, I think it's a, it's a, it's a tool and a strength that just helps someone live happier. Fashion is, it's, it's a very visual thing, but if it affects everybody, you know, I mean, you can put on a leather jacket and feel like, uh, and all of a sudden you put that leather jacket on right. and you're like, I am cool. I right, look absolutely. good. <laughs> totally. So, I mean, it really, it helps. Well, the crazy thing is I live in a black t-shirt and <laughs> jeans and okay. my life is very simple. Um, a couple leather jackets. And um, in fact, I was just talking to somebody about this because I have like, you look at my closet and there's like six of the same leather jackets, six okay. of the same because it's my little uniform and it's, you know, what I learned to be comfortable in. But I also know with what I do, it's not about me. It's never about me. It's about the people I work with. Yeah. So, you know, it's never about, you know, eyes on me or what I'm wearing. It's to make sure I give the attention to everybody else. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, layering's, huge again not even just with cold weather it's okay. and not even just with fall okay. it's everything so even you know we're doing a lot of like you know thin jersey like little soft um almost like dusters that then you can uh, put a leather jacket over the duster with right. the t-shirt underneath and you know like whether it's a skinny jean or a boot or a whatever like it's continuing the, the look of layering um but not just for fall and also it's um right now we're going through a whole huge spurt of um sort of um muted tones kind of almost like late 70s very like olive green burnt pumpkin you know all of that all of those dusty uh muted colors and um and i think it's fun because we had gone through jewel tones and things were much stronger and now we're getting more of a kind of a cool 70s vibe with everything I know that I've conquered what I'm doing and I'm really now trying to push outside the box. And I actually just was working with my design team of really, really just, I think for one thing, fashion is changing specifically because of the internet. Yeah. Everyone sees everything instantaneously. Plus young generation want it now and won't think about it next week. <laughs> so it's like, I need it now and move on. I need it now and move on. So we're really trying to gear um, ourselves not disposable because young kids, you know, are still wanting or now liking quality again. You know, it's enough of the HSN, uh, H M are like going and buying clothes that were disposable. They want things that last a little bit longer. They want to build a personality and a wardrobe. And so that's what we're working on. And it's changing globally because retail is changing globally. You know, I mean, even, even, what devastated me is when um, Zach Posen recently shut down. He's genius, you know, and it's harder than hell. And I was working with the company that financed him that just said we were losing so much money. We couldn't, you know, keep going. And it blows my mind because there's so much talent there. So, you know, it takes a combination of things for success to happen. And that combination, that formula is forever changing. <laughs> so I will forever be chasing it. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's about, you know, feel good clothing, whatever that feeling is. If it's, if it's, you know, something very grand and sophisticated and elegant, great. If it's just an amazing t-shirt and a pair of jeans that you're like, when I put this on, 
it, the way it, the way the shirt hangs and the pants fit, I feel good. So it's just like, you know, I'd like him to say like, you know, his clothes made me feel good. I just want to say thank you guys. Thank you for listening. Good luck in the future and fashion is fun. Mm-hmm.